Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the American Library in Paris's virtual evenings with an author series. I'm Catherine Olin, Programs Manager at the American Library. For those of you joining us tonight who don't know about the American Library, we are an independent nonprofit institution. And that means we don't receive government funding from either the French or American governments, but rather we rely on the support of our generous donors and in our community to a great deal. So I'm very happy that you all are continuing to join us and support us during this sort of strange period in which we have to find new and innovative ways to get together and build community. Um, the American Library is also the largest English language lending library on the continent. That's something we're incredibly proud of. Um, but it's not just a space for books and periodicals and that. It's also a very, very lively event space. Um, so I invite you guys to, if you might be interested, to check out our homepage. There will be more there about future events that we're hosting. And I'd like to remind you that we host events not only for adults, but also for kids and teens and all ages. Um, I should mention quickly, since it's our centennial year, that we actually have our Century Gala happening next week. There's still time left to buy a virtual pass for that event. It's on October 8th. Um, so you can read more about that again on our homepage. It would take it would take an hour to get through all of the exciting things that we have planned for that evening. So I'll invite you to do that. Um, so our guest this evening is Kirsten Chen. She is the award-winning best-selling author of the novels Barry, What We Cannot Take, and we'll be discussing that one tonight, and also Soy Sauce for Beginners. Born and raised in Singapore, she lives in San Francisco and is currently at work on another novel about the counterfeit luxury handbag trade. So uh, to begin tonight, I'll just invite Kirsten to give us a short intro of Barry, What We Cannot Take, which is of course behind me and here, I'll, I'll spotlight that for you. <laughs> and um, then a short reading and we'll move on to an interview. So thank you so much for joining us, Kirsten. Thank you, Catherine. Um, and thank you everybody who um, logged on tonight. It's such a thrill to be doing this event with the American Library in Paris. Um, I am a lifelong Francophile, a, a passionate student of French. And so um, even zooming into Paris is really a wonderful thing for me. So thank you, Catherine, for um, organizing this and making it happen. Um, I'm gonna read um, just a little bit from my novel, Bury What We Cannot Take. This is my second book. Um, the novel is set on a tiny island off the coast of Southern China. Um, it takes place in 1957. Um, and when the book opens, a brother and a sister witness their grandmother defacing the portrait of Chairman Mao with a hammer. The family gets in trouble and has to flee very quickly to Hong Kong. But when the mother of the family goes to get the necessary exit permits, she's told to leave one of her children behind as proof of the family's intention to return. Um, and I started working on this book way back in 2011. And at the time it felt like historical fiction with a capital H. This felt like a story very much grounded in the past. Um, but as I dug into the research and as I dug into the writing um, and as the political climate around us changed, I started to see just how contemporary so many of these themes are. Um, so to give you a couple examples, this is a book um, about a refugee family forced to leave their um, home country and to rebuild their lives um, in a country that's often hostile toward them. Um, it's a book about the way that borders tear families apart. It's a book about um, the, the devastating consequences of separating parents and children. Um, and it's also a book about a patriarchal society in which the women are really compelled to subjugate their own. So if, if you do pick up this book, you'll see that it's the mothers and the grandmothers that um, per perpetuate the customs that end up pushing their own daughters down. Um, so, you know, on a more personal note, um, writing this book really gave me new insight into my family history. This isn't a story, it isn't autobiographical, um, but my mother would have grown up in a society not that different from this one. She would have been about three years younger than um, the little girl in this novel. And um, so, you know, writing this book gave me a new appreciation of the things she had to overcome to um, go to America for school and get a doctoral degree. 
Um, and it also gave me a new appreciation for the values that um, my mom and my dad had to reject to give me my childhood. Um, and so that was an, a kind of unexpected effect of um, all the work that I put into this. Um, so I'm just gonna read um, a short excerpt from the beginning of the book. And um, this is a chapter that takes place from the mother's point of view and just a couple names to keep in mind. Um, the mother's name is Siok Hoon. Um, her mother-in-law, who's the grandmother that hammers the portrait of Chairman Mao, her name is Bi Kim. And then the two children, the brother is Aliam and the little girl's name is San San. But you'll pick it all up by context. So. How did one tell one's daughter that the entire family was going to leave her behind? By dinner time, Seok Hoon still had no answers. The only thing she and her mother-in-law could think to do was to deliver the news as matter-of-factly as possible, as though they could somehow lull San San into failing to notice what was about to take place. They gave me three permits, Siokun announced, taking her seat at the table. Aliam, grandma and I will go first. San San will stay behind with Cook and Wea just for a few days until her permit comes through. The girl's chewing slowed. She lowered her chopsticks to a rice bowl. Sukun rushed to fill the silence. We'll leave on the very first ferry tomorrow morning so we can meet the train in Xiamen. Bi Kim chimed in, did you hear that, Alia? Make sure you get all your packing to done tonight. The girl stared into her bowl. Siokun kept talking in that same relentlessly cheerful voice. Auntie Rose will stop by every day, so don't even think of skipping piano practice. When you arrive, you can play your new piece for your pa. He'll be so impressed. Ah, yes, said B. Kim. Your pa's loved classical music ever since he was a young boy. San San's face gave away nothing. How many days? One or two, Siokun said, four at the most. Sansan's eyes locked onto hers and she read something like defiance in her daughter's steady gaze. If the girl refused to be placated, then couldn't she at least sob and shriek like other girls her age? It'll go by in no time. Cook can prepare all your favorite food, said Siokun. Ridiculous words that would soothe only a younger, simpler child. That's a marvelous idea, B. Kim said. Girl, write down everything you want to eat so Muya will know what to buy at the market. Sansan San bit her lip. I don't really care. So Kun shot her mother-in-law a look of desperation. What about Popia or Kiampeng? asked B. Kim. Aliam said, give her my permit. I'll stay behind. So Kun's pulse soared. The permits have already been assigned. Aliam's still unchanged voice always rose in pitch when he was agitated. But if someone has to travel alone, shouldn't it be me? Tsyokun's hand smacked the table. I can't discuss this right now. I have enough to worry about as it is. Aliam squinted and looked away and Tsyokun regretted her tone. May I be excused? Sansan asked. B. Kim leaned over. Are you feeling ill? Do you have a fever? She pressed the back of her hand to the girl's forehead. Tsyokun motioned for her mother-in-law to retreat. Go ahead. Her daughter's footsteps blasted down the hallway. Sansan's bedroom door slammed shut, the noise as sharp as any rebuke. In the center of the table, a skin of fat had congealed on the brown sauce in the dish of braised pork. May I be excused too, said Aliam. Sukun so threw down her napkin. Whatever you want, she said. I have to give the servants their instructions. She stood and went to the kitchen. Bikim tried to make up for Sukun's harshness. Your father needs you by his side, she told the boy. I know, he said, but I'm worried about Sansan. From behind the kitchen door, Siokun watched her mother-in-law smooth the cowlick on the back of her son's head. The boy had grown several centimeters these past months, but was still small for his age. Bikim said, Cook will take Sansan all the way to the border. She'll only be alone for the very last stretch and then we'll meet her in Hong Kong. She released a strained laugh. Have some faith in your sister. Sio Kun turned to find Cook and Muya waiting by the stove. Don't worry about little miss, Cook said solemnly. We'll take good care of her while you're gone. In two days, he was to go back to the safety bureau to try again. 
Seokun handed over an envelope for the director, fattened with even more money than the first, along with a promise to send twice that amount for Cook to keep once Sansan was safe in her arms. Muya wiped tears from her eyes, even though everyone supposedly believed the family would be gone for no more than two weeks. Seokun thanked the servants for their well wishes and retired to her room to finish packing, making sure to leave several valuables prominently displayed a crystal vase of chrysanthemums that were just starting to wilt, perfume bottles with yellowed French labels. When she was done, she went to her daughter's room. The light was on, but Sansan lay on top of the covers with a pillow over her face. Her beloved doll was splayed on the rug. Siokun picked up the doll and smoothed its sparse blonde mane. What happened here? Sansan kept her face covered. I'm too old for dolls. Seokun set the doll on the nightstand. Are you feeling a little better? No. Seokun sat down beside her daughter who didn't make room on the bed. When she lifted the pillow off Sansan's face, the girl threw her forearm over her eyes. Seokun said, it's only a few days. You already said that. The girl rolled over to face the wall. She stroked her daughter's back, her fingers lingering on the faint knobs of her spine. I'll miss you, Sansan. In a spiteful voice, the girl replied, but it's only a few days. When had her children grown so rancorous, so mean? All right then, Seokun said. She rose to her feet. Her daughter's shoulders trembled ever so slightly and she softened her tone. Do you want me to turn out the light? I don't care. Seokun tugged on the chain and in the darkness, her daughter stirred. Mama? Seokun flew to the bed and enveloped Sansan. At first, the girl's thin body held taut, but when Seokun tightened her embrace, Sansan melted in her arms. Tears streamed out of Sansan swiftly, silently, soaking Seokun's neck and chest. In that moment, Seokun believed she and her daughter could stay intertwined like this, that she would never have to let go. Thank you so much, Kirsten. That was a, a beautiful passage. I mean, I think everyone can see why why I loved the book, and I hope that those of you who choose to check it out or purchase afterwards um, will quickly understand why we've invited Kirsten to talk with us about it. Um, I just found that to be such a rich illustration of the the relationships between these characters. Um, it sort of sets the scene for for everything to come. And of course, we won't get into spoilers tonight, but um, I will go ahead and ask you some questions about the book. Um, so maybe to start with, uh, you know, you're obviously employing the, the third person um, when you're when you're writing this book. But what really struck me is this the strength of the children's perspective um, throughout the story. So you follow a few of the characters um, through different sorts of adventures and traumas and, and such. Um, but I thought that it was a really powerful move to choose to really hone in on the emotions these children are feeling um, when the world is is basically becoming so chaotic around them. Um, so how did you choose to do that? And um, was was it clear to you right away that Sansan would be one of the central figures of the story? Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah. So um, I've always loved novels with rotating points of view where you get to see each character's perspective. Um, and when I decided to tell this story, I knew immediately that I wanted to do that because, um, as maybe you've already gotten a sense of, this is a story where every character is keeping secrets from everyone else. And I think that really lends itself to the rotating point of view. Um, and then on top of that, um, there's this incredible tragedy that's at the center of this family and each family member is complicit in that tragedy in some way. And so I wanted a way um, to really delve into the guilt of each character and then also um, to delve into their justifications for what, how they decided to behave the way they did. And so, um, yes, I knew from the beginning that the children would have to be a part of it because they too are complicit. They, they too bear the brunt of um, the consequences. Um, and I was very nervous about that. Um, because uh, this is a difficult story and in, in, at times it's a very heavy, um, the, the, the historical backdrop is immensely complicated and it's a heavy story. And I worried that the children wouldn't be able to kind of bear the weight of that. Um, but, you know, as I wrote, I realized um, that, I, that I had misjudged them, that I'd underestimated them 
the way that adults always underestimate children, I think, you know, um, we always think we need to protect children. And then um, constantly parents are saying to them that I was, you know, uh, my child said something today that was wiser than anybody else has ever told me. And um, an interesting um, corollary to that is when the book came out back in 2018, it was right around the um, tragic shooting at uh, in Parkland, Florida, at that high school in Parkland, Florida. And I remember very clearly those teenagers, those young people standing up and speaking about their feelings and also about the change that they wanted to see in their community. And us adults, we were floored that they were so intelligent and so thoughtful and so um, clear-eyed about these problems that adults had been trying to solve for decades. And so I think that was another kind of lesson, you know, that um, that often it's because we're protecting our children that we think that they're incapable of feeling deeply and, and seeing clearly. And so, um, so I'm, I'm, I'm glad that the, the children's point of view resonated with you. It, it, I don't think I could have told this story without it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I liked that you already mentioned the secrets that the, the family is keeping from each other and from others and from the authorities and this type of thing. That's a really, really um, important sort of plot device that you, you develop quite well and use throughout the book. Um, and related to that, I think that secrets, um, holding them or choosing to hold them can test our loyalty and loyalty is a theme that I thought was was a really important one for you in the book. So loyalty, you know, it informs our quest for meaning. Um, how do we stay loyal to those we love, to our family, yet also to our country, to our different political ideology, which may not be aligned with that of our country of residence? Um, there's all sorts of fascinating questions around there. But I wondered if you would agree that loyalty was sort of a driving force behind your book. And then if so, why is that of particular interest to you? Yes, definitely. I mean, I think when I think of loyalty, I think of um, duty. I think of family loyalty, just like you said, or duty to your family, duty to your country. Um, I think a, a lot of it must have to do with my Asian background, the fact that I grew up in Singapore. I think in Asian cultures and in a lot of other cultures, um, family duty is a huge part of it. There is um, no question that a child's role is to make their family proud. And so I think that's kind of been a sort of prevailing maybe obsession in my mind of how, um, how does one um, stay true to who one, who one is. So personal fulfillment, personal happiness, as well as um, fulfilling the duties that one has as a child, as a citizen of your country. I think that's something I've always um, considered. Um, and, I, and I kind of come down on, on different sides depending on, on what I'm exploring. So in this particular book, um, oftentimes family duty and duty to country is at complete odds with personal happiness. Um, but in my first novel, Soy Sauce for Beginners, which is set in contemporary Singapore, a very, very different book um, in which the protagonist is um, trying to escape her family business in Singapore by building a life in America and kind of asking that same question. She comes up, she comes up with a different answer. And so um, to answer your question, Catherine, I think it is a kind of lifelong obsession. Um, it, I think it will end up being a lifelong obsession for me. Um, and um, unfortunately, in this particular circumstance, um, we can see how, how it tears characters, some of the characters apart. Right, absolutely. And also the entire families as well, their friendships and things like this are, are definitely affected by the events of, of the novel. Um, so I wanted to talk about that next to discuss family. Um, you, you beautifully explore how, you know, we, in the passage you just read, this relationship between a mother and a daughter, you also explore how that can fracture, how that can threaten to break. Um, and then in other parts of the novel, without, without any spoilers here, we see um, in some sense, a new family being being formed um, through non blood ties, but rather shared experience, um, poverty, trauma, those types of things. So I wondered if you could tell us more about the different types of families that you explore, either fracturing or, you know, forging ties coming together. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I would say that um... The resiliency of family is always what was at the heart of this book for me, um, which sometimes seems like a strange thing to say because this is a book about the fracturing of family. And so, you know, it's interesting that my way in was 
thinking about family resilience, but I guess what I mean is um, what I came to see was that um, if all of us look back far enough in our family histories, our families have been through trauma, you know, for the most part. I, I remember when um, back in 2018, when I was doing a lot of touring for this book, um, readers would tell me, um, you know, my family lived through the Holocaust and this same thing happened to us. Um, readers from Iran would say this happened. P readers from Korea, right? There's just Vietnam. I mean, there's just, um, this is this kind of fracturing of family due to political or, or political circumstances or poverty. I mean, it's um, a situation that is incredibly tragic yet incredibly mundane. And that's kind of what makes the tragedy even more horrific. And so I guess um, that that was what I was thinking about. I was thinking about how our families have gone through these kind of unspeakable tragedies, and yet we're all still here with our parents and our siblings and our uncles and our aunts. And so somehow families hang together through these um, through these traumas and make it through on the other side. So um, for all this, for all the things that happen in this book, fundamentally to me, it is um, it is still a hopeful. It, it is still hopeful, you know, because, um, like I said, families can withstand a lot. Right, and I think that's actually a really sort of relevant message for all of us here tonight, who who may have been separated from our loved ones for quite a long period, as we face confinement and the challenges and restrictions of travel during the pandemic. Of course, not to compare the situations exactly, but you know, that's that's kind of a a heartwarming message to hear at this moment, I think, for many of us. So thank you for that. Um, to switch gears a little bit, I wanted to, to talk more about the sort of socio-political historical uh, setting of the book. So your novel paints a very grim picture of early Maoist uh, communist education, as well as youth league party involvement, these, these types of things. We, we hear of the children undergoing um, different sorts of drills or you know, punishments that bring about, you know, intense feelings of shame. Um, and each, each, uh, each sibling in this um, novel sort of reacts very differently to that, to that context, I would say. Um, and I wondered if you could, you know, tell us, first of all, what, what sources you may have used in order to, to hone in on those powerful experiences and really capture the emotional intensity of them. Um, and also just discuss a little bit what imp impact do you think that those early experiences have on a child's psyche or sort of um, freedom of thought even, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that was um, the, the impact of those policies on children was of course a pivotal part of the book. Um, the reason the family gets in trouble is because one of the children reports the grandmother to the school authorities, which is what children were taught to do, of course, at that time. They were told to bring any problems from home to their teachers. Um, and so, yeah, so I, I did a lot of research for this book. I mean, um, months and months of just reading basically whatever I could get my hands on. So I read, um, I read a lot of novels from this time period. I read a lot of memoirs. I read history books, economic, uh, economic books. I um, watched a lot of films, documentaries. Um, and so I thought that I got a very, um, or a, a fair, I felt like I gained a fairly clear understanding of the kind of external pressures that these children were put under. And, um, you know, from a Western perspective, um, I think it's fairly simple for us to grasp the kind of pain and hardship and and um, and sorrow that these children must have gone through, but it wasn't until I um, talked to an aunt of mine who had lived through this period that I felt like I I fully under uh, that I had some insight into these children's um, into these children's hearts. And so um, I have an aunt who, um, well, if if you allow me a slight digression, I have an aunt who um, has a very interesting family history on her own, but. Um, to give you a little bit of context, my fam my father's family, um, right after World War II, moved from, migrated from China to the Philippines. And when my aunt was a teenager in the Philippines, the Chinese government had sent out young people all over Southeast Asia and other parts of Asia to recruit young people to come back to China to rebuild the fatherland. So that was a huge project, a huge campaign to bring students, college students, high school students back to China. 
Um, and my aunt was recruited by one of these underground communists when she was 15 years old. And so um, when she was a teenager in the Philippines, she took the money that her parents had given her for the next semester, secretly purchased a plane ticket and ran away from home to go back to China. This is almost the exact time period that my novel takes place. And she ended up being trapped in China for 20 years. She didn't see her family for 20 years because the border shut when the communist policies got stricter and stricter. So that's kind of the context. So I, I have an aunt who has lived through this time period. And I was very fortunate that I was able to interview her for this project. Um, and so when I talked to her about the things that she went through as a student, um, she was, you know, she told, she was very, very frank and she told me so much about it. But what stuck with me most was that she mentioned the idealism and joyfulness of the students that had come home. You know, she said, we were so happy to be there. And once we arrived in China, the students were treated as heroes and they were given all the food they needed. They were put in schools. They were given dormitories. Um, they believed they were fighting the, the battle of their generation. And she said, um, you know, it was it was so safe. We would we were welcomed everywhere. At night, when it was uh, too hot, we would take our bedding down to the basketball courts and sleep underneath the stars. And we were all fighting for the same cause. And obviously, she also talked about the incredible pain and trauma that came after. But I think that beginning idealism was what I needed to learn because I couldn't see that from the outside. And I think the young people. And the young students, they really believed that they were fighting for good. And, and maybe in a small way in the beginning they were, you know? And so um, hearing that from her, I think was what gave me um, the ability to see these children as full complex characters and not just kind of my Western facsimile of what it means to go through that kind of um, education. Right. And I think you achieved that very, very sort of richly and fluidly. I mean, they're, they're obviously different and opposing viewpoints that each of these two, two characters have, but we're sort of cheering for both of them. We want the best. We can understand where they're coming from. So yeah, kudos to you for, for doing that intensive research and trying to also in, inhabit a role that you weren't necessarily sort of intuitively drawn to. I think that makes the book, book even, even more powerful. Um, I wanted to turn back to something that you already sort of mentioned slightly, but this is the fact that you know certain details in your book reveal these um, very deeply ingrained societal gender roles and gender norms, I would say um, we have you know things like the grandmother has bound feet. Um, there's a sense that there's privilege and protections that are extended to the son over the daughter. Um, the father feels a great deal of pressure to sustain sustain the family and the wealth within the family. Um, so is this something that you wanted to draw attention to or criticize or just get your re readers to reflect upon? Yes, definitely. Um, I think it's something that I think about it in, in my own life all the time, how far we've come in terms of gender equality and how far we have left to go. Um, and I think I was also thinking about how um, this is a historical book, but it wasn't that long ago. You know, in 1957, this woman, the grandmother in this household has bound feet and that's not an uncommon, she's probably the last generation, but there are plenty of people alive now who remember 1957, right? So, um, you know, it's only a couple generations before us. And um, I talked a little bit about this in my introduction, but I think I was, deeply interested in the role that women ourselves play in upholding the patriarchy, right? The patriarchy wouldn't exist if we weren't ourselves willing to pass on these customs. And, um, you know, it's, it's, um, it's well known that um, women do perpetuate, uh, often are the ones who perpetuate the, uh, uh, who have the most kind of immediate role in perpetuating the customs. Like in this case, because the mother is in charge of the children, she's the one who has to decide um, which child she takes, which, you know, how to raise her children. Um, oftentimes at, in this particular time period, the fathers were not even involved in the education of their children. So, um, so yeah, it is something that was important to me. And I think I was also um, grappling with that, you know, being able, I think a lot of times, um, and I myself am guilty of this, we're impatient. You know, why don't we have a woman president? Why are women still treated um, 
by the media differently by uh, men of the same uh, in this when they're you know competing for the same roles um and these things are you know it's easy to kind of get enraged about this but i think um also realizing you know what is the history that we're we're kind of coming out of how long does it take to break these ingrained patterns um and also what advantages are conferred, you know, if you do choose to kind of go with the status quo, what, what are you gain, you know, people are making calculated decisions. So yes, I was thinking about all of that. And I still am, as you can see. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you for, for developing that a bit for us. Um, I also wanted to talk about the fact that you follow characters um, who come from different classes. So these characters have varying degrees of, you know, assets, wealth, education, um, mobility, and yet we see so many commonalities, actually, so many of them are ultimately searching for the same thing. Um, I wondered if you could tell us a little bit more about that and what it was like to, you know, to explore characters from very, very, very different circumstances and yet to try to communicate something about the human condition through each of them. Yeah, I'm, I'm so glad that you pointed that out. Um, I don't, I don't know that it was something that I was consciously thinking about. Um, but I do remember when I was doing research for this book and I took a trip to um, Drumwave Island, which is this tiny island that, uh, where the book is set. And my father came with me on this trip because he had a distant relative who lived there and he wanted to take me to meet her. And it was so kind of him to use his vacation time to come with his daughter on her research trip. It, was, it ended up being a wonderful trip. Um, but I remember when we were going to see this distant aunt of his um, and I asked him something like, um, he, we showed up at her apartment, which was this kind of first floor, very, very humble, dark, flat, um, at the bottom of this sort of rundown small building. And I remember saying in surprise, oh, didn't her family used to be wealthy? And he said, what does wealthy mean under communism? Everybody was the same. And I think, you know, I don't think I had really digested that at that point but of course that's true right that was the kind of tenant of communism and factory owners became janitors and professors were sent to the fields to work and you know education land owners were the most uh, vilified of all and um education and wealth was seen as something to be incredibly ashamed of um and so yes i think that um probably less consciously i was thinking about that how how everybody, um, you know, nobody had it easy and how everybody had to kind of fight struggle through the same um, problems. Although you will see that, uh, you know, obviously there are still different differences in privilege um, from the chapter that I, I read, the, the family is still living in a big house with service. And so this is kind of the very beginning of communism. And I think um, the situation steadily devolved from 1957 onward. So that's one thing. And then the other thing is even those who lost everything still had relatives abroad who may have had money. And so even within that system, there are gonna be variations, but yeah, for the most part, I mean, I think um, most people lost everything. Right. I wanted to turn to another theme that you've sort of already gestured to, which is this theme of refugees. Um, so many of your, your characters are political refugees or sort of would be economic refugees. Some of them aren't able to escape or to make it out, others are. Um, and it's obviously, as you've already said, it's a topic we're thinking more and more about as we see what's happening in the Mediterranean or really all over the world with climate change as well. Um, so was this one of the one of the goals at the time that you were writing actually to sort of specify you know the the plight of political refugees or is this something that you sort of latched onto after and realized that you'd actually written on something that was tremendously relevant and universal for us in this moment? Yeah, I mean it's 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 definitely not something I specifically tried to do. I think that I went into this book thinking I need to make these characters real. And I think that applied to all the characters. So, you know, each member of the family for sure, but I also wanted the, um, the officials who have to say no to the visas, to have to say no to the exit permits, to feel like a real, I wanted him to feel like a real person. Um, I wanted this teacher at school to feel like a real person. Like all of these people are, um, are who they are because of their circumstance, I guess, is what I'm saying. And so, um, yes, I did set out for, for each of these refugees to feel real and whole and complicated, but 
I think I approached every character the same way. And, um, you know, I've been working on this book for so many years that I wasn't concretely thinking about the news cycle until the book was um, pretty close to publication. And so, yeah, when the book came out and when I was starting to do press for the book, um, definitely um, the refugee crisis were front and center um, in all of our minds. And, um, you know, all I can say about that is, um, I would be honored if this book can change uh, anybody's mind or illuminate, um, you know, that would be a great honor if that if the book could do that, but it definitely isn't something um, I started, you know, it wasn't a starting point, I guess. Right. So I'll have time for just a couple more questions and then we'll open it up to the audience. I just wanted to give everybody a sense of where we were in this this evening. Um, but I definitely wanted to give San San her moment. So she's like one of your most important and sort of my favorite protagonist in the book. Um, and greatly due to her, I think the, the novel is a tale of her remarkable bravery. Um, the circumstances she's facing, which you have already outlined sort of the, the preconditions for, are incredible. There, you know, she faces everything from hunger to poverty to loneliness, isolation, abandonment, which she herself, I think, does conceive of this that way once she once she realizes the family may not be returning as quickly as she had hoped. Um, but I, I still found, um, you know, you achieved something really wonderful in the way that she comes across as vulnerable, but also powerful and strong. So I wondered how it was to write a character that was so equally balanced between those emotions and who sort of tugs at our heartstrings in certain moments, but then in many of the moments we're really, I mean, feeling a great deal of admiration for Sansan. So tell us more about how it was to write her. Yeah. Um... I think writing Sansan was maybe one of the, the real pleasures of this book. Um, I talked a little about this already, about uh, as an adult, our tendencies to kind of um, underestimate children. And I think for me that, that Sansan was the clearest case of that because in the beginning, um, I thought her brother would be the main character of the book because, so I'm talking about draft one and this book went through 10 full drafts, but in draft one, I thought her brother would be the main character because um, in this particular society, um, boys have more agency. He's um, 12 going on 13 and she's only nine. And so um, he would have a little bit more ability to move around on his own. Um, and then he really drives the action in the beginning of the book. So I was pretty sure in the beginning that he was going to be the main character. And then after that first draft, I saw that, no, it had to be Sansan. She's the one who bears the brunt of the consequences. It has to be her. Um, and um, I was very nervous about that, you know, because um, she's young, she's a girl, you know, can she kind of stand up to it? But um, again and again, she's, you know, as I was writing her, she she surprised me by with, with her resilience, with her uh, fortitude. Um, and I don't know that I had a, a real strategy for kind of balancing all the as different aspects of her because of course um, it's difficult to imagine, um, you know, she is who she is because of the circumstances that she goes through each step of the way. And so it's difficult to say if a child that I, you know, a nine-year-old that I know in San Francisco could ever be her, you know, it's it's impossible to know because she has gone through things that no other child I know has gone through. Um, but I guess um, all I will say is that that, that goes back to this idea of, um, you know, being just being aware of how wise and how resourceful children can be. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you for developing that point further. Um, so of course, the, your novel doesn't have to be, you know, a message for humanity, it can also just be entertaining. But, but I personally found so many lessons from it that I, I wanted to, to get into that a little, a little bit more. Um, I was left feeling very hopeful, as you as you've already expressed, I think that's one of the intentions behind capturing these children's stories. Um, but I think there are other characters also who have sort of transformations who do surprising things. Um, for, for the love that they feel or they're inspired to feel for somebody else who may not be even somebody you would you would assume. I mean, I'm thinking in particular of, of the two women. I don't know if I should spoil okay. that. Um, <laughs> the, the love for a daughter, sort of the, the displaced love that can come as a result of loss. Um, I'm wondering, but those of you who have read will know what I mean. Um, so do you think that, you know, if you wanted to tell us any any of the other sort of lasting lessons that your characters have for us or other inspirations that you found as you were writing them? 
Yeah, that's such an interesting question because I, I don't know that, um, that I ever go into a book thinking about what I want a reader to take away. And I think part of that is because now that I'm two books in and I've talked to a lot of readers, I've learned that readers will take away whatever they want and I have no control over that. And you know, everybody has their own histories and their own concerns and their own obsessions. And um, a writer would be a fool to think that they could control anything about a reader. But, um, but I will say that, um, that in general, I tend to gravitate toward very open-ended endings. And for a long time, I thought that was just an aesthetic. Um, but now that I think about it more, I think that the thing about an open-ended ending is that the book kind of forces its way into a reader's life. Um, and I'm thinking about the books I love that have like incredibly, incredible catharsis and like incredible, um, incredible catharsis and it ends in this really dramatic and satisfying place. And then you close the book and you say, oh, that was really wonderful and you can walk away. And when you have an open-ended ending, which is sometimes not as satisfying for readers, I understand. So I apologize if you're one of those readers that really likes closure and I get it, I sometimes end that way too. But I think when you have an ending that really opens up at the end, um, readers are kind of forced to take it with them a little bit more. And so um, I see now that that part is intentional. Even if I'm not um, entirely drawn to a particular message, I do hope that the characters live on in my readers' minds in some way. Right. Um, and that their lives resonate a little bit. Yeah, and I wouldn't say that it's uh, completely open-ended. I think you you build a lot in so that we can kind of draw our own assumptions from mm -hmm. from what will play out um, in, in whatever follows sort of the page you leave us on. So um, again, thank you so much for this conversation. And at this point, I'll invite the audience to please submit any questions that you might have directly in the chat box. And I'll go ahead and spend some time here um, reading those aloud for Kirsten. So thank you for, for that portion of this event, Kirsten. Um, I do already see one question that has come in, so I'll, I'll jump right in. Um, this is from Heather, who says, could Kirsten speak, uh, speak about the following? The family leaves Sansan to save themselves. How can you compare this to minors sent across the US border to be saved from violence or poverty in their own countries, but also to save their families? Yeah, do you, if you need to see it, it's in the chat box to everybody. Yeah. Able to. Okay. Oh, this is a complicated question, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, look, I don't, <laughs> I understand that this is, you know, incredibly complicated and that, well, you know, the situation that, um, the situation that Sansan's family is in is a little bit different from, um, well, you know, I don't want to general, generalize about the situation we're seeing right now. I think every family is in a particular circumstance. In this particular family in the book, um, the family is told that uh, she will get her visa within a number of days. And that's the reason the family goes. So I think that, that there's a particular circumstance in the novel. Um, with regards to how this comes, I mean, I think that, um, I think the, the, the only generalization I can make is that what this shows us, the fact that this is happening today on our borders in huge numbers, all I can say about that is that this is a situation, again, unspeakably tragic, but yet unspeakably mundane. So many people are going through this right now. Um, and yeah, so I, I don't want to generalize, but um, but I think it's tragic. And I think that, um, that these families are going to be living with the repercussions for generations. Right. Thank you. Um, and as, oh, we have another one right away. Great. Uh, so Eileen is saying, hello, Kirsten. Uh, that was so wonderful. Can you compare the research you're doing for the upcoming novel um, compared to what was done for Barry, What We Cannot Take? Yes, it's wonderful. So Eileen is a, is an, a student of mine from um, our MFA program um, in Ashland, Ohio. And I do want to make a little plug because Eileen has a new short story collection coming out called Ancestry. And it is wonderful. And if anybody was going to ask what books I'm reading right now, I was going to give her a shout out. So I put that in right in the beginning. Ancestry by Eileen O'Leary, debut short story collection. Um, but yes, so um, like I said earlier, the um, 
uh, I did an incredible amount of research for Bury What We Cannot Take. It was probably the single most challenging aspect of the book because, um, because the political the political time period was so complicated and because I, I, I really felt like I had to get it right out of respect for the complex political time period and also out of respect for the people who survived and lived through that time period. And so um, I, I felt a lot of pressure to get a good pressure, I will say, because um, because it made me do the work that was necessary, I think, for um, getting this novel done. Um, and then Eileen asked, how does it compare to the upcoming novel? So I'll tell you, um, my new novel is, um, it's called Counterfeit and it's centered around the uh, counterfeit luxury handbag trade. And it's set in contemporary San Francisco and uh, contemporary Southern China. So again, a completely different book, um, but it kind of grew out of, as. A, um, I, I kind of, I found these days that each novel I write is a reaction to the one that came before. So when I was working on Very What We Cannot Take and I was deep in the middle of research, I said as a joke, um, the next book I write is going to require zero research and it's gonna be about a topic I know like the back of my hand. So it's gonna be about handbags because that's the only thing I know about that would require no research. So it started as a joke um, and then it grew into this novel about the complexity of the counterfeit handbag trade. And so it's actually ended up, it's ended up involving a lot of research. I had to go to Southern China and visit some of these factories where handbags are being made. And I went to um, talk to a lot of um, vendors that sell fake handbags. And so I spent a lot of time doing that. I talked to IP lawyers about what's going on in China in terms of copyright law. So it's, it's involved a whole nother kind of research, but, um, uh, which is how these books grow. But I would say that it stemmed out of a desire to write about something that I felt already expert in. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. And so we're, we're still waiting for questions. Please feel free to submit or maybe some of you are working on typing them. Um, but in the meantime, I wanted to ask another very obvious question, which is where can we get the book if we're interested in ordering? Um, hmm. you know, there's, there's, there's Amazon, but there may also be other places or different websites you'd like us to explore um, local. Yeah, I'm local. not sure what, um, I'm not sure in France to be, to be honest, what um, I, the book is widely available online. So so uh, if you don't want to go to Amazon, it's on bookshop.org, it's on Barnes & Noble, any, any independent bookstore would have it available for order. Um, where are the, I, I don't know um, in, in France uh, in particular, but. Yeah, um, our, so our book selling e partner is, uh, is the Red Wheel Barrel, is our book selling partner. Oh, oh uh, okay. Uh, so you should be able to order anything that that you'd like from Penelope, who's the owner of the Red Wheel Barrel. Um, also, Shakespeare and Company is is a very famous and beloved bookshop here. Um, there's W. H. Smith, but that's of course not not only in Paris, uh, but we do have our own branch. Um, so yeah, those are those are great suggestions of, of places to start. Um, anywhere in San Francisco that you would recommend, actually? Oh yes, in San Francisco. In San Francisco, um, there are tons of great bookstores here. We're so lucky. Um, the Booksmith is a fantastic one. Green Apple is a fantastic one. Um, all of those ship. Um, I don't know to France, but I imagine they do. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, so we do have another question coming in from Paul who is asking, what authors have influenced your work? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I would say for this particular book, one of the kind of touchstone authors for me was um, Edward P. Jones, who wrote a wonderful novel called The Known World um, that um, it won the Pulitzer, I believe in 2004. And so if you haven't read it, I would highly recommend it. Um, it's a novel that's set in um, the antebellum South um, in a um, imagined county in Virginia. And one of the most striking things about this book is the richness of detail. It is just the, the, it is just filled with statistics and numbers and um, any kind of detail imaginable. It's just so rich with detail. Um, and one of the most astounding things about this book is when I was reading about Edward P. Jones, I discovered years after I'd read the book that he had done zero research for the book and that everything, all of those statistics and details and numbers and place names had been imagined. And um, for someone who, uh, like me, who was writing historical fiction for the very first time and who was grappling with my um, insecurities um, and with my doubts as to whether I would ever do enough research 
to be able to write my book, um, reading about Edward P. Jones just gave me the confidence I needed to, to really embark on this project. And, you know, obviously I didn't end up taking his, his uh, I didn't adopt his philosophy for how to write historical fiction, but um, it was incredibly freeing to know that was possible, to know that somebody had managed to convince us all of this, um, of, of this imaginary world and to make it feel so incredibly real. Great. What did you say the, the title was? I may just type that in the chat box. Often people it's like It's called it. The Known World. Okay. I can, by Edward P. Jones. Okay. And The Known World. While I'm doing this, I should also invite Eileen actually to, to drop your, your work and your title in if, if you'd like to go ahead and, and plug it quick. So there's Edward P. Jones. Um, so I think we've got maybe time for one more question. If I don't see one, I'm gonna go ahead and steal the last question. And this has sort of become a tradition that we like to do with our authors. Um, do you have, you know, you're already sort of getting into this. Oh, I do, I do have a question. <laughs> so would you like to tell us about your previous book? I'll save mine. Oh, sure, yeah. So my first novel is, um, it's called Soy Sauce for Beginners. Um, it's set in contemporary Singapore. It's about um, a young Singaporean woman who moves to the US to escape the family business, which is an artisanal soy sauce factory. Um, but due to um, a series of difficult circumstances in her life, her, um, her husband leaves her, her mother fall, falls very ill. She's um, forced to move back to Singapore and she really has to grapple with everything that she tried to escape. Um, so, you know, on the surface, it feels like a completely different book, but I think um, some of the themes, as Catherine mentioned, um, some of the themes that I'm interested with, I think will carry through my entire career. Great, thank you. And uh, my question, I guess we will have time for it. it. It's just a very quick one, which is what are you reading now? Or is there anything that you can recommend to us as we've still got all of this time to continue reading? Yes, of course. Yes, so many. I love this question because I love to talk about what I'm reading. Um, so many friends have come up with amazing books um, during this period of the pandemic. And it's a little bit sad because um, nobody can go on book tour. But on the other hand, everybody has time to read. Um, so I just finished another wonderful short story collection by Laura Vandenberg. Um, it's called I Hold a Wolf by its ears. It's really weird and cool and, and atmospheric. Um, I'm currently reading a book called Monogamy by Sue Miller um, that on the surface appears to be a very quiet family drama, but then takes a kind of electric turn in the middle. Um, and it's so well done. Um, I also finished you can tell I have a lot of time to read right now because I'm talking <laughs> about all the books. Um, one last book that I just finished by um, Nancy Kim and it's called The Last Stories of Mina Lee and it's set in Koreatown in Los Angeles. And it's one of the only books I've read that's kind of set in this very particular milieu. Um, and it was recently chosen for a Reese Witherspoon's book club. So. That's a big endorsement. You don't need mine if you have hers. Um, but yeah, those are those are some of the things I've really enjoyed in the past couple of weeks. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. That's great. Um, and thank you for being here with us tonight, Kirsten. And again, to our audience as well, thank you for your wonderful questions and your engagement. It's been a pleasure to just spend this hour with everybody somehow connected, if not in the same room, if not under the roof of the American Library, at least still within the community and beyond. So thank you, Kirsten. And I will just say a few more words. Um, traditionally in person, we, we do accept donations of about 10 euros or whatever people are comfortable with. And we're still accepting donations. Um, I included a, a link to our donate page that went out with the Zoom link in that same email. So if you feel inclined to support us, um, especially given that it's our centennial year, we've just turned 100, um, it would be wonderful to see your support. Um, I should also mention we're, we're pausing events next week, well, adult events in any case, the children's and teens will continue, um, but we're, we're totally focused on the gala. So again, that's on October 8th and it should be a wonderful event. Please check out the website if you're interested in learning more or purchasing a virtual pass. Um, and in the meantime, uh, happy reading to everybody. Thank you so much for being here and until next time. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>